Sometimes it feels like the sun will never rise, like the birds will never sing again. That's right. When you don't know what to do, just keep on breathing. From the City of Angels in Los Angeles, welcome to all my listeners out there in Radio Land. I'm Dave, the Caregiver's Caregiver at caregiverdave.com. Also coming to you live and on demand 24-7 on numerous syndicated radio and podcast networks on 26 global audio and video platforms, including iHeartRadio, iTunes, YouTube, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Vimeo, Stitcher Radio, Blog Talk Radio, and a whole bunch more. And in fact, we're proud to be voted number one caregiver podcast of the top 50 on Player FM and number two caregiver podcast on Feedspot out of the top 60 and number two podcast on caringvillage.com. And we have an especially exciting show planned for you today. Dr. Lynn Steinberg is an expert in parental alienation, which I did not even know that existed, but they've got a name for it and everything. And the author of the book, You're Not Crazy, Overcoming Parent-Child Alienation. Parental alienation is when one parent weaponizes the children to reject the other parent without a valid reason. Boy, that happens so frequently, especially to my brother when he went through a divorce. 22 million parents and extended family are affected by this devastating phenomenon, For the past 10 years, Dr. Steinberg has specialized in working with parental alienation by being an expert witness in the courts to prove parental alienation. She also reunifies parents and children in her four-day family reunification program, has a 100% success rate. But before we get started, I do want to take this moment to thank my last week's guest, Patricia Boswell. She's a licensed practical nurse who has worked in home health care settings as well as in private duty nursing. And just a reminder, you can watch or listen to that interview and all our interviews on our membership website, caregiverdave.com, or any of our other 26 global audio and video networks that I mentioned earlier. All right, enough of that. Welcome to the show, Lynn. Thank you, David. Uh, I always like to ask my guests just who is Lynn Steinberg and why was she placed on this earth? (laughs) That's a question, a big question. That's a question. Yes. I mean, I don't know if you mean that professionally or personally or... Just any way you want to take it. (laughs) Well, I feel like my purpose of being placed on the earth right now is that I'm trying to teach people about parental alienation Hmm. and prevent children from um, being alienated from a parent and not having their parents in the lo- in their lives because I think that children need two parents as long as there hasn't been abuse. And the parents I work with have not abused their children, but they've lost a good deal of custody and um, maybe custody altogether. And the courts are mostly responsible for this, but also the laws. So I think my whole life has shaped into doing this kind of work, which for me is more than just writing a book. It's a real mission in my life. And and you're right about the courts because uh, it, it depends on where you are. Some courts... You know, the, the mother can do no wrong and they're against the father. And in the Caribbean, there are some islands where the courts, if you're a black man, you're, you've got the benefit of every single doubt and the mother seems to have no rights. So how do we fight that? Well, I think in the Western world, um, we are fighting it right now. Um, I don't know how they do it in the third world countries, but I do watch closely to see which countries are enacting law against parental alienation. So there's more and more at this point, and there's something that was developed in the Sudan intervention, which included third world countries, where they came up with a law 
that's against domestic violence and coercive control, which includes controlling a child to turn against one parent. Yeah, and that happens in the Middle East as well. When、oh, uh, a、yeah. Middle Eastern、um, parent marries an American woman, for example,、um, it's just an ugly situation. Very much. <clears throat> so you've dealt with that as well, huh? Oh yeah, I have a many clients who are from the Middle East and India. Yeah, because it's all those are very patriarchal societies, and if they live here in the states. You know, it's hard for them to understand that we don't have the same laws here. So, how does this affect the children?、Uh, is there resentment? Are there other things? Explain. Yes, I mean, there's so many consequences from、um, you know being alienated as a child,、um, anywhere from very low self-esteem because they've been told that they're. One parent is no good, and of course, they're half that one parent.、Um, there's a lot of substance abuse disorders. We see a lot of eating disorders, and career failures, relationship failures, and also a tendency to marry someone like the alienating parent that you had. So it's multi generational, and、um, unfortunately, a lot of A lot of children have committed suicide. Not a large percentage, but a lot of children. Oh no! So this this has long-lasting effects well into adulthood. Yes. Oh, definitely. There's so much、oh. depression in these children. You know, they feel so much shame and guilt when they realize what they've done, because children are very vindictive against the alienated parent because they're following. The other parent's direction to、right. be vindictive and vengeful, and it's a horrible situation. And it's not only with parents;、uh, grandparents suffer from this as well. Where, Absolutely, where they,、um, you know, for whatever reason, they had.、Uh, this is going on in in、uh, our lives as well. One of the children, you know, just、uh, has something against us, and they turn the grandchildren against them, but. Fortunately, when those grandchildren become adults, they usually come around. Not always, but we've been fortunate.、Mm -hmm. Well, not only grandchildren, but all extended family.、Mm. So、when a child is alienated against a parent, they also reject the extended family: grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, friends,、mm. and that's at the direction of the alienating parent and. It's only when there's parental alienation does this phenomenon take place. When a child is physically abused and they're removed from the home, very often they go and live with the extended family, with like a grandparent.、Mm -hmm. um, but with alienation, that doesn't happen because the children are also turned against the extended family. So sad. So, are you making any headway? Are people starting to listen? I think so.、Um, recently, we had a bit of a setback、um, because there was this law introduced、um, that said that if women accused men of domestic violence, then men could not defend themselves or turn around. And say that this was parental alienation, and so we've been working very hard、um, to try to squash it in different states. Unfortunately, it got through in three different states because there's millions of dollars attached to accepting this law in the different states. So we did well in California by getting the legislatures to erase a good part of it and put what we wanted in it, but、um, so far we haven't had that same success in other states. You know,、mm. it takes a lot to mobilize people to <clears throat> contact their legislators. Yes, yes, I agree. Yeah. So, were you an alienated child? I was.、Um, my 
mother actually, I think in today's terms, you would say kidnapped us, my brother wow. and I, and took us to a different country. And whenever we would ask about our father, she would say, he doesn't want you. You can tell he never contacts you. Well, she had changed our names and he didn't know what names to look for and which country to look in. Wow. And um, when we were older, we found him. Unfortunately, he had died a month, two months before that. Um, but his wife was still around and, you know, told us that he'd always wanted to have contact with us. So I found out a lot later in my life that he did fight for us and did try to find us. So how did you deal with that? Was there guilt? Was there remorse? Was there bitterness toward the other parent? Uh, yes. How did you deal with it? Yeah, I was very angry at my mother for doing that. So now yeah. you're alienated to both parents. like Yes. Yeah, I mean, I don't think no we've been alienated against our father had we lived. Sure. Um, he was a different kind of parent. And my mother basically used that to punish him for whatever went on in their relationship. And that's what alienation is about, is getting revenge against the other parent for leaving yeah, They're punishing them, yeah. Exactly. So yeah. let's bring caregiving into this. How does caregiving... Um, affect someone who's been alienated or maybe uh, the other way around? Well, I think this is a really interesting issue. Um, a lot of times adult children will reunify with the alienated parent. And I think those children are more likely to feel good about taking care of their elderly parent mm -hmm. when it comes time or their dying parents. I think it's much harder to take care of a parent who alienated a child against mm -hmm. the other parent because there's so much resentment. Yeah. And in actual fact, my brother did this. Um, there were 10 of us children, and my mother stayed with each one of us because she was a very dependent person. Um, and in the end, she had gone through all of us, and so there was just my one brother. And he was a very pragmatic person and, you know, put her on one side of the house and he stayed on the other. <laughs> and they seemed to do well, you know, for a number of years until she died. But he had a lot of resentment and anger toward her, not toward the rest of us who didn't want to do it at all <sighs> or had tried to do it. Um, but he had resentment toward her. So how do you bring these families together? Because you say that you have conferences or um, interventions. or How do you do it? Right. Well, the, it's usually when the children are younger. So they're younger than 18 years old. They haven't aged out of the system, as they put it. Um, so oftentimes we get a court order, order in the four day intervention or reunification. So the and courts understand this and they actually, uh, help. Yeah. I mean, nowadays they do, um, not all together. Like I appeared before a judge yesterday and, he didn't listen at all. You know, he was elderly and he thought he knew everything and wouldn't hear anything about it. But most often these days, I think that um, things have changed and they are ordering these four day interventions. And I meet with the children and the alienated parent, And um, I basically break down all the myths that have evolved out of this breakup of a relationship um, and then reestablish the bond that was there before this happened. And it, it's so successful. I think <sighs> How it, successful? It, I have a hundred percent success rate. Wow. Everyone who comes in leaves 
you know, with a, with their relationship with their parent again. And so because- even, <clears throat> even the parent who caused all of this, you, you see true remorse and regret? No, <laughs> no, not at all. <clears throat> well, what's the, what's the hundred percent then? Well, with the alienated parents and the children. Oh, because so you can't help the, the one who alienated that's damaged perhaps forever. I think so, because most often they have um, personality disorders, you know, because who would deprive the child or the the parent? The parent. Who would deprive their child of the relationship with the other parent? Mm -hmm. You know, most often it's a personality disorder and they do not go to therapy if they can help it. So even though they're ordered into therapy and I'm put in charge of their therapy, they can sort of manipulate their way through therapy until they start seeing their children again. But hopefully the children will have enough ego strength at that point that they would be able to resist being alienated. How do you use psychotherapy to deal with those conflicts between the caretaker and the patient? The caretaker and the patient. Well, um, I think that the way I would approach it would be to bolster the caretaker's ego or self-esteem or, you know, way of dealing with it so they can be pretty practical about the decisions they can make. And you're talking about the patient being the parent that was alienated as opposed to the patient being the parent that was the alienator? (laughs) <laughs> That's pretty confusing, huh? Um, I I'm can't imagine. Of- it's almost as weird as being a caregiver for your ex-spouse, which happens a lot. Yes, know? yeah. But um, does it happen that that's, that an adult child who's been alienated uh, would actually become a caregiver to the alienating parent? Uh, I know I- that has happened, you know, and there's so much resentment and anger, like with my brother. He did become that caretaker, Mm. Um, and he pretty much used me as his support system, even though we lived in different countries, you know. Why was he doing it? Out of guilt? Out of responsibility? Because he surely didn't want to do it, right? He didn't want to do it, but the rest of us, nine people, had all been through it already. Wow. He was the very last His turn, huh? Yeah, it was his, he was the only one who said, okay, I'll do it. He was the only one who said, okay? Well, after the rest of us had been worn out already, (laughs) yeah. How much time did the rest of them put in? Like a year or less or more? Various times. I mean, I think I tried for about a year. Um, But yeah, I think shorter times for some of my other siblings who were pretty proud that they could say no quickly <laughs> and not be bankrupt or some other thing. Sure. Yeah. So it's probably no um, effort to offer to be a caregiver to the parent who is uh, being alienated because you've, you've brought them all back together again and, and now the relationship is restored, right? With the, well, that would be with the alienated. Yes, parents. that's yes. the one I'm talking right. about. Yeah. And no, there, there would probably be way less issues, you know, not any of the resentments mm-hmm. and anger, but wanting to take care of that parent because they didn't have enough time with that parent. Sure, sure. Um, How prevalent is this? Because the divorce rate is 50%, and you got to figure that maybe half of those divorces are ugly ones where alienation is going on. Is that, is yeah. that an overstatement? No, not at all. Not so at 25% all. 25% of the population are probably uh, divorced children who have been alienated from their parent, one of the parents. I would say pro- it is probably that amount. I mean, officially it's 22 million because that's the statistic that's derived from research. But I think your figure is probably closer to the reality of the situation. Yeah, because we've had a lot of divorces in, in our family, you know, uncles and nephews and cousins. And, and some of them use their children as weapons to hurt the other spouse. And many of them went out of their way to not do that. 
and said, you know, I don't, I don't want them to feel, uh, you know, bad or uh, against my ex because, you know, he's a good guy. We just can't get along. And, and uh, you know, the kids need a parent. And so they're, they're reasonable enough to understand that, you know, it's not good to do that. And so I figure it's 50-50. Well, usually alienated parents will say that, you know, I don't want to bad mouth your other parents. And, it's happened to them. You know, and I'm going to try to work with this. But in yeah. the end, they have to be pretty combative in court to get to see their children. Yeah. And, um, and a lot of times the other parent doesn't make it easy do they? because <laughs> they're just jerks. And they, yes. I, I can think of another word, but I'm not going to say it over the air. Um, they they yeah. make it very difficult to be nice to them. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> and I try not to deal with them at all in my practice because, you know, there's all kinds of repercussions like getting reported to licensing boards and whatnot. So I yeah. try to steer clear. And so your, your opinion is that um, there isn't much of a recidivity rate Recivity, if I said that right, rate among those parents that uh, are causing the problems, th they don't change much, do they? Maybe 1%, 5%, the rest they, of them. They change according to how hard the court is willing to be on them. Mm. Like if the court, like the several of the alienators that I've worked with have been put in jail. Really? Because, because they just treat the court orders as if they never happened. So contempt, huh? Very much contempt. Contempt contemptuous of everyone, you know. Well, and it's only when the judge says, I've had it, you know, <laughs> you haven't listened for years, and that's it, you're going to jail. So several oh, of yeah, them they deserve it. I I hope jail <laughs> changes them too. Absolutely they deserve it. <laughs> yeah and then they do change <laughs> oh good well as yeah. long as they change yes when they see that the things are not on their side anymore you know they change yeah so you've been a caregiver as well yes i have yeah in many different ways yes i and mean have, my have you ever have you ever needed a caregiver you mean like a nurse when i had surgery yes Yes, I have, actually, yes. So let's talk about taking care of yourself when you're uh, experiencing burnout. What are the symptoms of burnout? What are the signs of burnout? And what are the things that we should do to get out of burnout? Well, I think there's lack of interest in the new problems that come along. Um, irritability, anger. Um, exhaustion, um, probably a lot that you could name since you're kind of in this field. Oh, sure. right? Did I miss any? Ask for help. Don't try to isolate yourself. Yeah, I think taking care of oneself, getting help, um, trying to have fun with the person that you're taking care of. That's right. You got to have fun. Yeah. Because, and just like raising my two-year-old, uh, you know, it's not easy to raise a two-year-old, but if I have fun and make sure she has fun, then we both have fun. It's a win-win. Yeah. But and one of us can't have fun because if I'm having fun and she isn't, it's not going to work. <laughs> no. and if she's having fun and I'm bored, it's not going to work. So we yeah. both have to have fun. Yeah. And there is yeah. a, a balance between being uh, a caregiver and having uh, a life of your own, right? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really important to make sure. And I think that was something my brother was really good at, you know, was that he could leave the house and have somebody take care of her and go and have his own life. He wasn't reticent about doing that. Yeah. And, you know, it, it depends on how you ask for help. Because I, I remember turning down help. You know, people was, hey, is there anything you need? Just call. No, 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 I got this. I got this. But then, um, you know, the, the best way to ask for help is say, hey, are you free on Tuesday at three o'clock? I, I need to 
uh, do something. Uh, and I'd love for you to watch my mom or whoever mm-hmm. or say, hey, you know, I, I, I'm low on lettuce and tomatoes. Uh, can you pick some up next time you're at the store? Uh, you know, yeah. just specific stuff. Yeah, I think that's very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. So you've written a book, right? I have written a book, yes. And what's the name of it? And what do you hope to, to uh, readers to get out of your book? Well, it's called You're Not Crazy, mm. Overcoming Parent-Child Alienation. And I named it that because so many alienated, probably all alienated parents when it first starts happening, feel like they must be crazy because here's a child they had a loving relationship with. They had no intentions of abandoning that child and, um, you know, were divorcing their spouse, not their children. So I think that um, that's why I name. I know that's why I named the book is to say, you're not crazy. This is a whole phenomenon in and of itself. And this is how you deal with it. So it's, yeah a lot to do with self-help and (sighs) one of the chapters david is what you're talking about it's by it's for spouses of alienated parents because you know if they married or they have a significant other that significant other feels helpless a lot of times and doesn't know how to help the alienated parent through all the um you know the jewish word mishigas yes Yeah, they don't know how to help that parent. So one of the chapters is about that. But I do have a chapter on um, how to help themselves, you know, what you can do to take care of yourself while all this is going on. Well, I have a a friend who's going through this right now. You know, it was an ugly divorce and they accused him of everything, you know. Yes, that's the other station. They were taken away, went to court. The truth finally came out. And so he was vindicated and uh, he had possession of the children. But now as the children are getting older, um, they, uh, they're, they're doing a new strategy, you know, where um, all of a sudden the, uh, one of the children who's not quite an adult yet is uh, decided they want to live with the alienating parent and the, the, new, uh, the new spouse Right, And so all of a sudden, the relationship between um, the father who was raising her, who won and who was vindicated, all of a sudden that shut down again. And it's almost like they're afraid of the alienating parent and what they can do to them. They definitely are. And, yes. and so he's not handling it very well. It, he just doesn't understand, you know, how this child can just turn against him when mm. she knows the truth, you know. He can see it in her eyes, but, but, you know, she'll look at the other parent and, and she's just under control. What can can he do to, to keep his sanity while he watches this play out and he has no control, no power? Well, if, does he have custody of the child? Um, Well, I think she, uh, the child reached an age where they can make up their own mind now, you know, teenager. Yeah. I mean, they say that, children can make up their own mind and i like did, 12 right uh, is that oh uh, no I had, I had impact on that bill i rewrote that bill because i knew what was happening yeah. so it's 14 that they say that children can make that decision yeah. but so I, the child is over that age yeah i don't think children should ever be able to make that decision yeah. so i think what he needs to do is go back to court And because children don't have the authority to say where they are going to live, even if they're 17, they have to wait till they're. I don't think he wants to open up that can of worms again. You know, that was just. I don't blame him. uh, I think he's just going to take his chances to let her get older and come back on her own, you know, because uh, she knows the truth and she knows he he loves the child and the child loves that person. But. you know, the, uh, the other parents are, are wealthy. And so they use that as a That's right. carrot or a weapon, yeah. you know, either removing yeah. them from the will or whatever, you know? Yeah. And, and it works. They, they just make it 
um, more attractive to the children to right. see with them. And of course, now they're bad mopping the other parents again. Sure. So they didn't learn anything. So but, what's his hope? If he doesn't want to go back to court, how does he keep his sanity while he watches this happen? I know it's so hard. It's such a horrible dilemma to be in. But um, I mean, if he thinks that he can't impact that in any way, then um, if he can persuade his daughter to go into therapy with a trained parental alienation therapist, because an ordinary therapist would just say, well, she doesn't want to live with you anymore. You know, whereas an alienation therapist would say, oh, no, you know, you are obligated to live with your dad and that's what you need to do. And I know it sounds like you're putting a heavy thing on them, yeah. but they are so over empowered, these children, to make. And what, what will he get out of your book by reading it? Well, he'll get what I just said, you know, that one, he's not crazy and here are the options. Um, this is common. It happens all over all the time. All over the world. Wow. All over the world, of course. Yeah. Sometimes that's just a relief, knowing that you're not alone. Yes. And it's, it's an injustice that's happening to a lot of people. Right. And I'm available to talk to if he ever okay. wants to talk. You can have him call me. Yes. Yeah. He needs to talk to people who. Oh, yeah. yes. And there are actually support groups, you know. Is he on the West Coast? Or? Yes, West Coast. Well, um, tell him to get in touch with me because there's right. um, a guy who's an alienated dad and he runs these support groups free. Yeah, support groups and I, they're, you know, people can come every day or they can come twice a week or once a week. Mm. But um, he provides a great service and it's free. And if people want to talk to you, what is your number or your email, how they can get a hold of you? Well, my phone number is 323-449-2203. Mm -hmm. And my website where you can push contact, and that'll contact me either by email or by phone, is lynnsteinberg.com. S-T-E-I-N. E-E-R-G. Okay. And Lynn is L-Y-N-N. Okay. And um, if you go on my web website, it has all this information on it Good. and um, how to contact me. And that's probably the best way. But my email address is lynnsteinbergphd at gmail.com. Awesome. Yeah. Well, we've run out of time and you've been a wealth of information. Uh, and just remember that all of our live shows become recorded pod and video casts on your favorite platforms. And you can purchase my number one newly released book, Secrets from the Hammock, in addition to our guest book. It's called Uncommon Wisdom for Uncommon Times, a great book that's changing lives all over the world, available wherever books are sold. And my website, caregiverdave.com, which is a free community membership support group. Um, lots of tools, resources, and free gifts uh, on that site. And check out my Facebook page, Caregiver Dave, a community of 34,000 caregivers. Wow. And if you click the like or follow button on whatever platform you're watching or listening to this interview on, it helps us reach even more caregivers by improving Google search engine algorithms. So thanks to all my listeners out there all over the world. And thank you for tuning in every Wednesday and making us the number one caregiver podcast on the internet. So until next week, same time, same channel, may God richly bless you all. Thank you. Thank you, David. I'm Dave Nassani. My fourth book, Secrets from the Hammock, Uncommon Wisdom for Uncommon Times, is a number one bestseller on Amazon. As a young boy, I was told I possessed an unusual amount of wisdom for my age. As a young man, I found myself counseling friends and older family members whenever they needed answers to their problems. Then at 21, I read the Bible for the very first time and learned how King Solomon asked God for wisdom instead of riches, yet he received both. I was so impressed that I too asked God for wisdom. Soon after, I discovered when lying on my hammock, I would receive wisdom from God. This book is the result of my passion to share with the world wisdom's tremendous benefits. 
Join me as I reveal practical aspects of wisdom for the mind, body, and spirit. 31 lessons I learned from God that can change your life. Available in hardcover, audible, Kindle, and paperback, wherever books are sold. I've spoken all over the country and London, and am available to speak at your event. Contact me at hammockwisdom.com. Sometimes it feels like the sun will never rise, like the birds will never sing. Uh. 